week of data and the square is filled, then we have seven days of data. And if it's not completely filled, then they skip one or two days. So that's always interesting to know. And if you see some reds, then you can go into the athlete and see more details. And the details are organized by day, so you have a vertical and timeline uh, view of all the information you need. And uh, you can draw your own conclusions, but because this is an assistant, it's not the completely truth. Sometimes you know more as a coach and as an athlete, and you can figure out why fitness levels are dropping or climbing in relation to sleep, for instance. And sleep is quality of sleep, but also duration of sleep. And the green pattern shows also the stability of sleep. If you go to sleep at every day at the same moment, your recovery is a lot better than when it's switched up and down for a couple of hours. So if you go to bed one day on 10 o'clock and the other way on 12 o'clock, then your recovery is worse than uh, when it's on the same time, although you might be having the same time of sleep. So that's something you can see easily here. And if you go down, if we go down, yep. You can also see indicators of um, HRV on the bottom and on the top. You can also see indicators of training load and training um, monotony. All right. Um, I'm not doing this alone. There's a whole team. Uh, Eric is uh, my colleague second one and he is doing triathlon swimming and uh, cycling. Arnold is our physician, sports physician, physiotherapist. Jacques is doing marketing. Bas is doing head, uh, he's head uh, software de development and he uh, Ed, Ed, yeah, it's a short name in Dutch but still it's Ed. Um, Ad, he's system engineer and our intern Sylvester is working on privacy and all the uh, legal stuff that's needed to get this system uh, waterproof, so to speak. All right, so that's the main thing I want to tell you. If you're interested, leave a note on the website or just talk to me when you're around. I'll be around until, sin until Sunday. And I'm glad to talk to you if, you if necessary. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the introduction, and Hank, thank you very much for your talk. Um, I'm here as three colleagues that are building this platform. David Townsend and Phil Lubacic are both in the room as well. Um, it started off as a bit of a, I coach internationally, struggling with data, spreadsheets, that kind of stuff. And since I stopped coaching, I had the time, and we've put some effort into this, to build this platform. And sort of basically what it is, it's a web-based platform, similar to what Hank's been talking about. Um, and it's a way of helping clubs organize the communication and manage all their data. Um, and like Hank was saying, it doesn't solve, give you any answers, but it gives you better insight into what you're doing, and that should help you improve your decision making. So, we come from a bit of the premise that the biggest struggle people have at any level is time. You know, people are at a limit to how much training they can do. The international athletes, how much more can they do in terms of the training? Club athletes, there's more pressure at home, they have to work longer hours, they want to train, they need to train more to perform, they struggle to fit it all in. School kids, more academic pressures, also need to train more. So this whole thing about how much more can everybody do, and when are we going to reach the limit? So, I just press something, I shouldn't have pressed, there we go. So, the question has to be, we can't just keep doing more, we need to do it better. So, the thing is to decide what is important to measure and measure it, and then remeasure it and remeasure it and see how things are changing. The thing for me that's interesting now with all these different data sources that are coming in, what's important to measure is about to change. What we thought was because we could measure before and we could manage the data, we would stick to what we know. But now all these data sources are coming in, it's going to ask different questions. 
And what was interesting, I think, listening to Michael speak earlier, with that looking at the numbers, is I think there's a move towards coaching skill instead of coaching technique. So people have in this mind's eye what a, a good technical model is, but what's that underpinned by? It's usually underpinned by who coached you before or books you may have read from the Fairburn days or whatever. But now if you've got data to say, actually this is how you should row, this is what the biomechanics are saying, and now we're in a position to measure and see that. So, so what is important, I guess, and it's going to be different for everybody, but fundamentally we want the boat to go quicker. So there's a skill aspect to that, which I talked about, so that under, you know, how well are you rowing, how well are you rowing in time with everybody else, what's your stroke length, what's your slip, all that kind of stuff. There's physiology, your flexibility, your strength, your endurance, you know, how good is your core, those are all aspects of physiology. And then there's around the behavior, so psychology, toughness, um, interpersonal skills with crewmates, all those sorts of things. And to some degree, there are components of each of these aspects which are measurable. And we need to measure those and decide what the right behavior or the right skill or the right fitness is and then work towards that. So not everything that's important is measurable obviously, but there's a lot of stuff and more and more stuff is going to become measurable. And what this causes is it causes a nightmare for coaches. Because coaches are busy enough dealing with what they've got in front of them anyway. So what do we perceive the modern challenges for coaches are? I think there's this whole thing about being centralized and being so remote, so national teams, big geographical challenges, having centralized athletes, athletes not liking that because their family's somewhere else. So you have people around big countries trying to train. You've got people that, who've got jobs, who travel abroad, who have to do their ergo session where they're at a hotel in Singapore. That's a challenge. School kids, training at holidays, those sorts of things. So there's this whole issue about where are you doing the training? Where are you generating the data? And is there a way of putting it all into one place so your coach, once your coach can see it and decide whether you're training properly, and the other one is, are your crewmates seeing you train to build that level of trust between a the crew? There is this issue when people don't train together, you start to lose trust within the team. Again, competing pressures of work, study, national teams, the, the pressures are, can they get, like Hank was saying, can people get enough recovery with the amount of training they're doing? Just by upping the mileage and upping the intensity, it's not going to work forever. Then, again, we talked about these many new sources of data, and this is, brings to the next point, which is we're going to be changing away from traditional ways of operating, and our own experience, speaking to people who are using our system, there's a big cultural issue within organizations, so national teams or clubs or schools. There's people who are used to having their spreadsheets and doing what they do and playing with their data and recording it all, but actually the athletes don't get much insight into what's going on. They have no access to the data. So they can't make good decisions, you can't educate them properly. <coughs> but also, you have to make a decision that actually by doing this, you are now relinquishing a little bit of control to the athletes because they get more information. They're probably going to start asking more difficult questions that you may or may not have answers to. But it's only ever going to be in the benefit of the athletes. So, what do we see the new possibilities going forward? So, at the moment, we did a project with the University of London, it's a club that we've been involved in through our rowing career, and they've been using our platform. And we analysed their data from, that they used last year. So they had an eight that made the final of the Temple Cup at Henley, eight guys. And I said to the coach, so what was the difference in training? What was the training programme? And he gave, he gave me this training programme. And I was like, let's go into your systems. We looked in through rowers and went through it. And basically, the, there was 50 hours difference in training between two different guys in the same crew. Now this wasn't the actual training, this was a difference in what he had prescribed those eight athletes. So he thought he'd given a club program, but actually guys get injured, ill, they miss sessions, you know, they, some guys cycling more to college, so they give them a few less sessions. Actually the prescribed training was 50 hours different, that was about 8% difference in prescription of training. He still had no idea what the difference in actual training was, because he wasn't recording the heart rate, wasn't recording their distance trainings, all that kind of stuff. So I think we're in a position now, because of these wearable devices, heart rate monitors, GPS devices, we can start to measure how far are people actually rowing. So you ride a 16k session, we're seeing really, really often, some people are doing 14 and a half, some are doing 17. Now if you do this over a whole season, you can have a massive discrepancy in what training people actually did. Then within that, how fast did they do it? What was their heart rate in it? What's the level of intensity? Do you have one guy that just pulls hard all the time? You have one guy that never gets any work on, <coughs> one guy works fine on the ergo but overworks in the water, all this sort of stuff, you have no idea. So we're so 
keen as coaches to prescribe a split or a wattage on the ergo for your 16 or 20k ergo, and then they go on the water and go, rate 18. That's just not useful enough. So, so this, is a, this is a picture from our website. These are different athletes, and it's the different amount of time they're each spending in the prescribed training zones. So they're given specific training zones based on some physiological tests, and you can see this athlete here has worked much harder than these athletes here, but you can see it all in one place. And that's kind of an insight. Now, you know they turn up, and you know they've done the volume, but how well are they doing it? And this is where we can start becoming more intelligent about what we're doing. Um, and as a consequence of that, different levels of fatigue, you start to see, like Hank was saying, you start to record people's recoveries, and you start to see which sorts of training work best for some people. You know, there's a paper that's just come out with the Kiwi pair, how off the water they both did different training programs because they needed different things. So there's personalization and optimization of training, and some of that's based on how well they're recovering from sessions. And all these, you know, I think next year there's going to be something like seven different telemetry devices available on the market. And that's going to be generate a ridiculous amount of information that people need to find a way of managing. But also, this, all this stuff, and people like Valeria and Connie who are going around the world working with teams and universities to make people understand what the data really means. And this is where I think we're going to be moving towards more of a skill-based coaching. You're coaching people to do the right movements to make sure they don't put their feet, the pressure on the stretcher too early going forward. You know, what's the difference between the stretcher force and the oar force? These things are things we don't talk about, but I think we're going to get more away from that, more towards that, and less about what's your hand doing, what's your posture, all this sort of stuff. Um, so again, it comes down to good record keeping. And all good coaches throughout history have been good at record keeping. You know, in the 70s, people would take photographs and go into town, get it developed, come back next week and show them the picture of the outing they've forgotten about. <coughs> or they'll write down good notes about the pieces they've done, comments about the session, but then the coach takes that home and the athlete hasn't got any of that. So, Hank, everything's going to move online in some way, which makes you as a coach feel like you're losing control a little bit. And I, I think that's just something we're going to have to get used to. Um, this whole thing about it's going to have to be more athlete focused and we're going to have to engage the athletes and use the data in a way that helps them, which in effect helps us produce better crews. So, lots of data is going to come in. Before you go around and collect millions and millions of gigabytes of data, decide what it is that's important for you and measure that and then measure it again and measure it again and keep improving. Okay, that's me. Thank you very much. So we have many more staff for questions. Thank you. Um, so, uh, have we any questions? And um, while you're thinking about your questions, I have one. So, um, could both of you, both of you have got live documents or live uh, systems. Could you give us an example of where you've seen collecting the data and managing the data has made a huge difference either to a coach or to an individual? Well, one of our users, um, they were doing morning monitoring with all the athletes and they were realising that if the athletes were coming in two days in a row and they were saying reporting to be slightly dehydrated and they were saying to the athletes, oh, are you drinking enough? And they're saying, no, no, I'm drinking normal, I'm drinking normal. And they said, so they realized that athletes have dehydrated two days in a row, but they're drinking the right amount of liquid, they found they just got ill. So that for them, that was a big alarm. That if they followed the morning monitoring, saw that their heart rate, saw that their hydration was low, but they were talking to the athletes again, just checking, are you drinking? And if they were drinking, they just pulled them back. And that was an instant way of in making the intervention. Yeah. Getting close. Uh, that's not very good. I take that one. Right. Well, we, we started this project a long time ago, and in 2007 we created a freshman's crew in, in Amsterdam, and um, I made the training programs using this data to uh, have individual programs. And uh, the, the, the crew was very fast. Uh, that can happen in freshman's crews, that's a coincidence sometimes, but we have a big uh, group to select from, but the main thing is that there was no injury all season and that they didn't lose any, any race. And that's because, of course, they, they learned technique, but they also had their individual program that they can be 
and load it as, as, as high as possible individually. And because fresh freshman rowing means that there's a lot of differences in between people, uh, a lot bigger than if you have an Olympic aid, uh, uh, because that's the, 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 those uh, training years. Well, when I was in the training in the eight, it was an average training age of about 15 years. That's different than if you start rowing. So those differences you have to use to load everyone to its maximum and have the maximum average um, speed improvement. And that's that's done by by data collection and using them right. Okay, questions. Thank you, Anna. Is it possible to synchronize uh, these uh, watches uh, with the heart rate to your um, application? How do you mean synchronize? To, re to record. To record not, you don't need to wake up in the morning three minutes before and take manually. Mm. But no, 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 it's, it's done by a heart rate belt. It's yes. by the heart rate automatically. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And also the, the record of the training can be uploaded any way you want. And, and any any one of the um, watches on the market are good. You, you can have well, there are some special because the HRV measurement needs a very very uh, accurate measurement. So there are only three or four heart rate belts that are useful, and that's that's Polar, Sento, Garmin, not all of them, and there's some uh, Canadian brand. It's uh, FIFA. It's very well. Okay. Very well. Thank you. I mean, just to speak to Rosie, uh, whether we'd like to do a bit of a demonstration, I think it would be quite dull for me to give it to you. I think if anybody's interested, I'm very happy, the three of us, to go through a demo and, and actually, because it does so many different things, talk about your problem and see if it does help you in any way. But we're happy to all weekend just to do any demos that anybody wants. Just come and find us. Okay, thank you. So I think what... what oh, sorry. Question. Yeah. Sorry, Milan. <coughs> uh, obviously, there is a two group of the data you, you're collecting. is the one in the recovery. Another one is uh, like a heart rate during the training session of workouts. And um, do you have any idea of the numbers of the data you can collect or what is the preferable uh, values you want to put on your, your platform? Um, any data is useful. That means a heart rate is only heart rate, but if you combine it with power or technical uh, results, we can make analysis about uh, physiologic, physiological efficiency. So if you have a higher power output with a lower heart rate, that says something about development over time. But also uh, mechanical uh, efficiency, if you look at uh, power output and, and uh, stroke rate, for instance, combined with heart rate. So you can ha make different uh, combinations of data and put it in a single value that says something about um, uh, development in time and and the more useful data you have the more you can use of course um, but yeah if you can collect it easy and upload it easy then it's also quick to have after a training session so normally if you have uh, a heart rate a system that sends data to Strava, then you have a report within five minutes to the coach and to the athlete. So you have instant feedback after training. And then the coach can see the different results from different crew members if necessary. Probably, um, as they said, that best if you go and talk to them about what issues you, you know, have you got a big squad, have you got one athlete, are you the coach, are you the athlete, um, are you managing uh, a remote group or are they all in the same place, uh, what sort of data do you want to load onto the system. Uh, so I, I think all of, all of those things are possible, but you probably need to go and talk to them about, a bit more about your specific situation. Okay, so I'd like to thank both our speakers and um